Um, a slight change in my title, George, I've called it management of Chile and needlegrass, which might become apparent why I don't use the word control a bit later. But um, I'm not meaning to give you false hope, but there is, is some things that you can do to help manage it. So I'm just going to run through the significance of Chilean needlegrass. So just a hands up, who knows what Chilean needlegrass is or have heard of it? Okay, hands up those that are concerned about Chilean needlegrass. Okay, so we've got a little bit of an understanding of Chilean needlegrass in the audience and why we should be worried. Which means that we probably, some of you probably don't know how to identify Chilean needlegrass or haven't come across it. So we'll talk a little bit about the ways of identifying it and how you can... Um, easily understand the plant's uh, habitat and life cycle. Look at some management options that are available to you and then just a little bit of an update on some local work that's been done out of uh, New South Wales DPI, uh, both the pastures unit and the biosecurity unit. So some work from that Bill Davidson here at Tamworth's doing and then some work that I'm doing up in Glen Innes. So, um, Chilean needlegrass is a native of South America. It's quite prevalent in Argentina, Chile, Uruguay, Paraguay, Brazil, those sort of lovely countries, which I've been trying to get a study tour trip to for many years, but I'll get there one day, won't I, Mark? Uh, no, he's shaking his head. Um, but it, there's a lot of conflicting reports about when it actually came into Australia, but it's probably around the 1930s that it came in. There's some very early reports before that, but it's unconfirmed whether it was Chilean needlegrass or another nacella species. Um, but it hasn't really, particularly in New South Wales, it wasn't really until the 1990s that it really sort of exploded and took over, particularly uh, on the Northern Tablelands and became a major problem. It's currently this map here, so I can get this pointer to work. Yep. This map here shows that it's currently in all states of east, southeastern Australia, from Queensland down through New South Wales, a lot in Victoria and a bit in Tasmania. But the climate predictions are that it's got a potential range of 40 million hectares in Australia. And that is this, that uh, red area is where it's really a hot spot. These dark green areas are quite suited. Greener areas are still suited, the yellow is less suited and the blue is not. So you can see that it also in the predictions, you know, moves over into Western Australia. So it is a little bit unusual because it kind of likes heavier, more f fertile soils, so basalt soils with high fertility, but uh, it will grow in a lot of different uh, soil types. It likes a rainfall of about 500 millimetres, so it's kind of in that temperate pasture zone. So. I guess there's a bit of a worry because not only is it a problem at the moment, but there's a potential to become a much bigger problem. Uh, why is it a problem? It competes with your desirable pasture species and out, sort of outplaces them, outspaces them, uh, it, particularly if the management or, or um, drought has left a lot of bare ground in your pastures, it'll quickly occupy and take over. But there's also um, the seed, which we'll talk about a little bit more in a minute, has the potential for stock injury as well or de downgrading hides or meat quality. So there's a few issues around the animal side of things, but it's mainly that um, it reduces your pasture value by about 50% over summer because when it's in maturity, it will uh, decrease the um, palatability of your pasture or, or decrease the, the quality of the pasture dramatically and you'll have a lower summer grazing uh, potential. Uh, what else did I was going to say there? I can't remember. But anyway, so why is it a problem? So like most successful weeds, it can produce a really large seed bank and that seed bank can be quite persistent and hard to run down over time. So there's a lot of numbers there. There must be a... Yeah, there is. Uh, that's just from a seed bank study that we did on the Tablelands a few years ago. Uh, various locations, various management practices. And you can see... Probably the main figure here to look at is this one here. So that's the post seed fall uh, seeds per metre squared in the soil after we had a pretty impressive uh, Chilean needlegrass year and we had lots of seed falling. So we had an average across the sites of about 3,000 seeds falling that from one plant into a metre square quadrant uh, over uh, one summer and then nearly 17,000 is the maximum down to at a different site where there was quite a different management strategy, quite low numbers. 
But the important thing to take from this big seed bank is that the seed in the top three centimetres can last about three to four years. The seed that's buried a bit deeper than that will last 12 to 15 years. So, and potentially come to the surface and, and germinate. So if you're having this many seeds fall into probably an existing seed bank of something equivalent, it's going to take you, if you do everything absolutely perfect from that point on and have no seed go into the system, it's going to take you at least 12 years before you're running down that, that seed bank. So it's a long-term enterprise if you've got a significant amount of Chilean nettlegrass in your paddock and you think that you've got an established seed bank. But as I said, there is hope. There are, this has become free management, which we can talk about a little bit, before, a little bit later. Now, the seed bank in Chilean nettlegrass is so successful because it has three ways of producing seed. So it's got three goes at the lucky dip. One is the panicle seed that we're probably all familiar with. So the puts up a reproductive tiller. The seed is what we call the panicle seed. And that is the most um, productive component of the seed bank. It's probably about two thirds of the seed come from that panicle seed. But then it can also produce seeds that we call cleistogenes, so right at the base of the plant. And those basal seeds actually start forming at germination. And then we have all the way along the stem where you have the node, so the little sort of nodule at the end uh, on the stem, you can also get a seed being produced there as well. So if you can see this graph, we had across the sites, we had uh, seeds being produced in six different spots other than the panicle seed uh, for those re reproductive tillers. And the average was about 1,100 seed or 1,200 seeds per metre squared but some sites were up to 14,000 seeds per metre squared just from those cleistogenes as well. So we've got this really constant and quite significant deposit of seed into the seed bank each year if you're not maintaining or managing that pasture. Um, so identifying it, probably those that, are, that know Chilean nettlegrass will recognise these uh, purple seed heads which form about now. So the plants start flowering sort of somewhere depending on where you are, but on the tablelands they're starting about now, so October through to December, January. On the tablelands, and I think it would probably be the same on the northern slopes, I'm not sure, but we actually get two lots of flowering, so we have a spring flowering and we have an autumn flowering, so we have another flowering about February. But you start to see these purple seed heads, the panicle tends to droop to one side and it can be mistaken for spear grasses, a lot of the native spear grasses, but, and apparently I missed this vital point in my notes, so sorry about that, but the seed head of the Chilean needle grass differs from most spear grasses in that it has that distinct crown. Can the people see that sort of crown-like? If you're looking at it sort of side on, it looks like a little crown, uh, and it's got that sort of twisted on Whereas this is a uh, native grass, native spear grass down here, and you can see that they don't have that crown. It's a bit harder to see the crown in that photo, but um, it's uh, there. It also has a really sharp point. If you do like that to your finger, it'll stick into your finger and it hurts, so don't do that. Um, but, and then the basil seeds look a little bit different. That's the panicle seed. But then you can see the basil seed and the nodal seed look a little bit more like a normal seed with a short awn and they're a bit harder to tell apart. Uh, if you want to come and learn how to do it, we can get you to do a few thousand hours of dissecting and you'll be an expert in no time. Um, so they're the key things to look for when it's flowering, um, which I said is now. The only one that it probably you might get confused with now in the flowering stage is giant brome or great brome. People are aware of that. It's uh, got a very similar purple floppy seed head at flowering, but it's when you actually go and look at the plant, it's got a very soft leaf and it's very different to the Chilean needle grass. We've got some Chilean nettlegrass plants at the back if you want to have a feel of them a bit later. Be a little bit careful because even though they were cut yesterday, they are still producing new seed heads now. So, um, but don't worry, they're not, they're, they're way off being um, mature, so they're not dangerous. <laughs> um, you won't be taking any Chilean nettlegrass seed home. 
If you don't have the flower head, it can be a bit harder to tell them apart from some other plants. Um, basically, if you feel the plant, it's got pretty rough leaf. There's little hairs on the upper surface. It's uh, very veined and has a definite midrib. And the ligule is quite distinct. So this is the ligule here. And you see it's quite tufted. And uh, you can see the hairs on the upper surface of the leaf there. So things that you can get it mistaken for are speedgrass, which I mentioned. Some people get it confused with tall fescue if it's chewed, they're both chewed right down. But so you just need to look for on the chili and needle grass, those features. But also on the tall fescue, make sure you run your fingers along the edges of the leaf on the margins and you'll get those little serrations, which chili and needle grass doesn't have. Um, and the other, the, so Danthonia is a native grass, uh, wallaby grass, some people call it, uh, feather top, white top, those sorts of things. It has a slightly similar ligule to Chilean needle grass, but it's a bit shorter and the leaves will quite often be smooth and they're um, a bit wider as well. So um, it's a little bit hard. It's one of those things, the more you get your eye in, the more you'll um, be able to identify it. I've got a lot of producers on the Northern Tablelands who say that they can spot it from 100 kilometres away now because they're so used to seeing it. Other features are because the seed, uh, the seed is spread by uh, animals, people, machinery, uh, water, uh, what else, something else, but it's not very well spread by wind. So you'll quite often have, if you've got chili and nettle grass in your paddock, you'll probably have clumps of it in your paddock because the seed doesn't fall very far from the original plant. So that's another feature, look for clumps of plants rather than sort of big individual scattered plants. It also tends to have a different colour. It sort of has a slightly yellowy green colour over winter. And then when it matures in summer, it's a really straw-like colour. Um, so it tends to be a different colour to a lot of other species. Has anyone tried to identify it or had taken it in to get a sample identified or or had issues around getting it identified? No? That's good. OK, this is a very wordy slide, sorry. Um, there's just, when you're managing chili and needle grass, because of that long-lived seed bank and, and the extensive seed bank, if you've got a significant, um, a lot of chili and needle grass in your pasture, and so I sort of say that's something around greater than 30 to 40 percent of your pasture has got chili and needle grass in it, then you're going to have a lot of trouble controlling it or eradicating it. You really are having to manage it and take that long-term option of trying to run down that seed bank as best you can, but at the same time utilise your pasture so you're not getting that uh, difference in animal production. And that can often be the challenge. So the, uh, we talked about the long-lived plants. These are the things that you need to consider when you're talking about how you're going to manage your chili and needle grass. Um, it can produce flowers in the first season, so it's unusual in that it has quite a short germination period and flower to flowering period for a grass, but it can be quite productive in that first season with seed. So it's important if you see a plant early to try and get on top of it before it's allowed to set seed so you don't get that seed bank starting straight away. Um, most of the seed has emerged and dropped by um, February, so you need to keep that in mind into to your planning your applications of treatments or whatever you're going to do. Um, seed can germinate all year round if the soil and moisture and cl climate is um, uh, desirable. Uh, on the Northern Tablelands, we see it germinating usually from about February right through to now, so you can have a a huge germination period, so that means it can be hard to get on top of sometimes. Um, they tend to be slow growing seedlings, but most seedlings survived. In a study that was done by Mark Gardner back in the 1990s, he showed that 90% of the seedlings survived um, in a, any given year that he did his study, so they've got a high, high survival rate. Um, and I think I talked about before that the seed that's buried deeper is going to last longer. So um, that might alter your management practices in terms of cultivation. You're not wanting to dig up that seed to let it uh, germinate. 
I think the, the one thing is, though, because of the, the um, mechanisms of that seed bank, not one control method is going to work. You need to have an integrated package of a number of different control practices. Um, just using chemical alone is not going to work. Just using grazing management alone is not going to be the sole answer. You need to have an integrated package of all of those things. But really, early detection and prevention is the best measure. So for many of you that may or probably don't have Chilean needle grass, um, there's a lot of uh, biosecurity issues that you can to, uh, manage to make sure you don't get Chilean needle grass. Um, so, you know, be just the basic biosecurity quarantining, uh, making sure that if you're buying fodder that it's not from an infected area or infested area, you know what you're buying. If you're buying animals that have come from an infested area, put them in the yards or a yard paddock so, and keep them there for a while so you know what, you can see what comes up after they've been moved out, after they're cleaned out. Um, clean vehicles and machinery, make sure you know where people are coming from. If they're coming from an area with Chilean needle grass, get them to wash down their vehicles before they come in the gate. Those sort of basic biosecurity issues, which you can all put into your biosecurity plan that was talked about earlier in the day when we were talking about animal diseases. Um, it's the same with weeds. You need to have a biosecurity plan and a plan of action so that you can minimise getting some of these nasty uh, weeds. If you do find an isolated plant after having gone through that sort of quarantine process or, or you just see, them, see it after a flood, because flood, uh, floodways are another way that you can uh, get Chilean nettlegrass to come in on your property where you previously haven't had it. If someone up river's got it and it comes down in the flood. So if you see it, the best thing to do if it's isolated plants is physically remove it. So dig it up, get a mattock out, pull it out of the ground, wrap it up, put it in the bin, or burn it is even better. Um, and this also, if, if, if you've got isolated plants and you're tempted just to spot spray them, that's not a bad thing to do either, but it will bear the so soil surface more. So if there has been a stray, if that plant's been there longer than you think and there is a seed in there, then it will germinate in that bad area. So it's really better to pull it out, particularly before it sets seed, and try and eliminate the problem in the first place. Chemical control is one of the main ways that we utilise to look to control or manage Chilean nettlegrass. Glyphosate and flupropanate are the two main chemicals that are used. Um, you can use them together in a given year or in a mix together. Um, but there are issues with both of them around bearing that soil surface. So if you bared the soil surface and you haven't come back and put something there to, to have some competition, then it's more likely that you're going to have little Chilean nettlegrass seedlings there when you come back the next time because you've bared that surface, made it a good, good environment for the Chilean nettlegrass. So you need to make sure that you've got some competition coming back in there as well. Um, Flupropanate can also uh, suppress or injure, in some cases, desirable pasture species as well. So it's a, a lot of people don't think that, they think that glyphosate is the main problem because it's a non-selective herbicide. Um, but there has been some evidence to show that flupropanate can affect uh, off-target species as well. Um, so it's always a good idea that once you have sprayed to come back and check regularly and look at what's happening where you sprayed. So it means it's a good idea to have a map of, of where your Chilean needlegrass is so you can come back and understand what's going on. And then also with the chemicals, particularly through propanate, there's some withholding period um, advice on the labels that you need to be aware of as well. So always follow that. Now, I'm not going to talk about different rates or when you should use it. It's going to be very different for each situation and whatever your management plan is. So if you want to use those chemicals to control Chilean nettlegrass, it's best to talk to your local uh, agronomist or advisor or the person that uh, does your advice on chemical application. But they're the two main ones and I'll talk a little bit more about some others later. The other thing to be aware of with chemical control, particularly with those chemicals, is the potential for resistance. Um, and, you know, particularly where you're doing a large area there's, and you're controlling a large number of weeds or trying to control a large number of plants, there's likely that there possibly has been some resistance. So make sure that you do things like rotate 
flupropanate and glyphosate at the appropriate times. Make sure you spray before seed set and use other control methods other than just using chemical control. So cropping, more competitive pastures, grazing, fertiliser, those sorts of things. Um, and always keep an eye on it, keep, you know, keep monitoring um, weed survival after spraying and, and seeing whether you think you have a resistance problem. And there is a lab that you can send, and I've got the details if anybody's interested in this, there is a lab that you can send samples to for um, determining resistance, if there's a resistance problem, so, uh, which we are trying to get, encourage people to do if they do think they have a problem. Um, pasture management and grazing. So obviously a healthy competitive pasture is gonna be one of the best long-term solutions to trying to get on top of chili and nettlegrass. Um, so you wanna make sure that you've got an a management system that's set up to favour the desirable species, so making sure that fertility is right, grazing management's right, uh, and that you use strategic use of chemicals at appropriate times to help with the weed control. If you've got a situation where you want to try and get on top of a large area of Chilean nettlegrass and you think you need to go back into uh, a weed cleanup process, you can use um, like a fodder crop for a couple of years, ideally a mixed annual fodder crop that Sue's talked about today. Um, or in our case, because we're in a summer rainfall environment, we can also consider using a summer crop to help clean up the paddock for two or three years um, before sowing down to another pasture. Um, probably the best thing to do is probably make that three to four years. We found on the tablelands that you need at least four years of a crop to try and run down that seed bank as much as you can, particularly in a, a largely infested area. Um, and then Chilean nettlegrass gets a bad rap for a lot of things and it's deserved, but it does have some moderate quality over that winter period when we are actually looking for some green feed. So if we can understand how to graze the Chilean nettlegrass to, get, to maximise getting some uh, feed quality out of it, but also um, helping to run down that seed bank by pre preventing seeding in, in the summer. So there's some different grazing management techniques that you can use to try and reduce uh, the chili and nettlegrass. Heavy grazing over winter for short periods of time when the plant is its most desirable <coughs> quality stage, uh, but reduce the stock before they start damaging the desirable winter species too much because they're probably not gonna be as actively growing um, you can, in spring, you can graze quite heavily to make, try, try and reduce the number of reproductive tillers that the plant will produce. And then over summer, you're probably not going to get much grazing out of it at all because that's when the stems, of, the reproductive stems are gone uh, to head and they've dropped the palatability of the plant quite dramatically. So, and it's also a good idea not to be grazing animals in those uh, paddocks when they're setting seed because the seed will stick to the animal and move around the rest of the property. So it's always a good idea to try and reduce grazing when it's actually setting seed. Um, so this is just some of the work that's coming out of Tamworth uh, through the, uh, it's a program with the Centre for Invasive Species and funded by the Department of uh, Agriculture, Federal Department of Agriculture. So DPI Pastures and DPI Biosecurity are involved with this project. Um, those who know Bill Davidson might have gone to his uh, demonstration at Lumbra last year on the same field day, um, where they're looking at the, an equ the equacy of a range of different chemicals uh, and non-chemical management strategies. Now, I think there is not only glyphosate and Flupropanate, but there's a whole range of different other chemicals that Bill has been looking at in that experiment. I'm not going to try and talk about that because I'm not familiar with that experiment at all. But if you're really interested in some local uh, information on chemical use in this region, then Bill's probably the person to talk to. Uh, associated with that project, so that's sort of stage one of the project. The stage two is a number of um, extension activities or what we call adaptation sites uh, on the Northern Tablelands in mainly the Gyra area, where we've got a range of, we've got seven demonstrations in collaboration with producers where 
these producers have been managing Chile and needlegrass for a number of years, and so they are um, they've been helping us to decide what we should be looking at, something a little bit out of the box or something they're really interested in doing. And so that ranges from looking at um, some strategic chemical applications, but mainly through non-chemical uh, treatments through to potentially making silage before flowering to see if we can reduce the number of, um, uh, set of flowering stalks produced through to understanding the different animal production on a Chilean needlegrass pasture with uh, some desirable pasture species in it compared to a tall fescue pasture. So looking at different, um, different strategies to uh, emphasise what they're already doing, but to try and build on, the, on their programs. And uh, with that, we've also um, um, used a drone to map those paddocks where the treatments are being applied so we can see whether there's any differences from the air. But also the drone operator is interested in doing some uh, spraying of, of the Chilean nettlegrass using his uh, drone technology as well and, and developing a, a, a um, program for Chilean nettlegrass spraying. So uh, that's kind of an interesting project. Uh, Bill is also doing a replicated pot experiment looking at the impact of flupropanate on a range of different uh, pasture species. So as I mentioned before, there was some uh, there's been some off-target damage of pasture species, so Bill's just trying to come up with a, a list of which species are more sensitive to flupropanate than others. Uh, that's a relatively new project, so it's in initial stages of work. Um, so I've been mucking around with um, an alternative chemical, uh, essential oils. Uh, in this case, pine oil, or some people may have seen it uh, referred to as bioweed. It's, a, it's just a, an organic chemical uh, made out of pine uh, leaves, uh, pine oil, so it smells pretty. Um, and we've run a pot experiment, well, a, a series of pot experiments over a few years looking at the effect of pine oil on uh, seed, germinating seedlings of chili and needlegrass, um, seedlings and then mature plants. And I'm not going to go into all the results today, but I can just show you that these were all before treatment. These were an hour after treatment. These were two hours after treatment and these were seven days after treatment. So you can see that there's quite quick uh, suppression. I'd rather call it suppression than death, although the seedlings and the uh, seeds, the germinating seedlings and the sort of slightly bigger seedlings did die with um, pine uh, oil application. But this is just uh, work that's been done in the glasshouse and it really needs to be validated in the field and see whether it can have a role just as another tool in the, in the sort of weaponry against Chilean needlegrass. So uh, we're trying to, to do some field evaluation of that uh, in conjunction with those adaption sites that I mentioned, but also in some work that we're doing at Glen Innes. Um, but one of my real interests is understanding uh, so we have a lot of people in the Northern Tablelands that have got quite significant uh, levels of infestation of Chilean needlegrass. So some places have got greater than 60% in their pasture. Uh, and as we've seen, it's a long-term uh, enterprise to try and reduce that down. So how can we do that, but at the same time get some value out of it from a pasture point of view in terms of animal production? And as I said before, we have shown where we've had high intensity grazing with strategic chemical use. The seed fall over a season was about 100 seeds per metre squared. Where there was no grazing and very limited chemical use, we're looking at that 17,000 seeds per metre squared. So there's a big difference in um, you know, these sort of more integrated management packages compared to a very, well, no management package really. So, and at the same time, we've been doing a little bit of work on understanding the quality of the Chilean needlegrass at the same time. Uh, so this is a bit complicated, but at the top here, we have the various stages of the Chilean needlegrass development, through from vegetative, stem elongation, booting and flowering, seed drop. And then this is just these blue bars are just the, um, yield and it was in a very, it was in a continuously grazed pasture so it's, it was, and it was on the edge of the 
<clears throat> a dry period, so it was really uh, quite low biomass. But Chilean nettlegrass was basically the only thing in the paddock. Uh, this blue line here is crude protein. And down here refers to whether we, we had a number of plants set up and tagged where we went back to and we could understand whether they were actively being grazed over that period of time. And so over these, this period here from April through to October, it was being actively grazed. It actually was not great protein, but it was reasonable protein. Uh, and there was some form of being able to utilise that pasture. Over this summer period, we got a more sharp decline in crude protein. There was no active grazing uh, until we started to get into autumn again, where the plants started to uh, regenerate in terms of become green at the base again and um, became grazable again. So by understanding that, and that's only once over one season, we want to do that over a lot more and, and particularly in different seasons. Uh, we decided to, we need to do some, well, about two minutes. yeah, this is my last one, I think. Um, we need to do some replicated grazing experiments to kind of understand what's happening, not only to the, the Chilean nettlegrass and the pasture that the Chilean nettlegrass is within, but also what's happening to the animal production and how it's being affected by that different uh, quality cycle. So we're looking to do a replicated grazing experiment over probably two or three seasons where we're looking at, as I said, not only this, the Chilean nettlegrass uh, measurements in terms of growth pattern, biomass, uh, phenology, nutritive value, those sorts of things, but also monitor animal production uh, over those treatments and over the, maybe not the whole period, but at least over a 12 month cycle, we'll have a look at the animal production and what it actually uh, means. Uh, but we're also doing a number of little component studies within that to try and understand a few other aspects of management that we could implement to try and um, just once again have a, a, a more integrated management package. So one that we're just starting at the moment is looking at tropical grasses uh, and whether they can provide some competition over summer for the Chilean nettlegrass and improve the palatability of the pasture. Uh, and we're also looking at some suppression techniques to try and reduce or to stop seeding of the Chilean nettlegrass before we sow a tropical pasture and look at the, the competition aspects with that. Uh, another thing is silage. If you ensile Chilean nettlegrass seed for long enough, then it uh, kills the seed and it won't, um, you know, if you feed the silage out at a later date, the Chilean nettlegrass is not going to come back from the seed. So we want to look at different um, silage treatments that we might be able to do on some, on, in some instances. Uh, slashing is another one. Slashing and mulching is something that people are keen to try and uh, do in that period before flowering. And then also we need to validate the essential oils in a field situation as well. And I think that is it, yes. So the question was, has there been any reports of flupropanate resistance? Um, and yet, uh, yeah, not not validated reports, if you get what I mean. Like there's people report it, but it, whether it, we haven't actually followed it through to see. But I mean, I'd be surprised if there isn't because, you know, well, I know people that have been spraying for 30 years and they still have acres of chili and nettlegrass. So yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm assuming there, there will be. And part of the, the work that we want to do uh, or subject to further funding is to actually do a resistance study um, on the tablelands and in, in southern areas of the state as well. Because I should have said that work that we're doing with the Chilean nettlegrass is actually just one part of a bigger project that's looking at African lovegrass and serrated tussock as well. <laughs>